good afternoon, <coughs> and thank you for inviting me today to share my experiences of OSI integration with you. Ricard gave me a call at Friday at three o'clock, <laughs> so I wasn't sure if I was thanking him then. Um, yeah, my name is John Sullivan. I'm based at the Re Prosthetic Rehabilitation Unit uh, at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. I work for the NHS uh, just under half the working week, and I work independently um, for the rest of the time. It's great. And my, my involvement in OSI integration started around about 97, um, when the program was undertaken, <coughs> partly funded by the Department of Health at Queen Mary's Hospital in Roehampton. And the team there was read, led by predominantly uh, Professor Kingsley Robinson uh, and Dr. Suri. And it's great to see some of my colleagues from Roehampton here today, who I might pick on later, I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, moving on. So I'm going to talk briefly about, yeah, uh, hang on, just about rehabilitation overview. Uh, and we'll start really with the assessment. Uh, and a good quality, thorough assessment is absolutely essential prior to osteointegration, integration as opposed to a cursory assessment. Why would somebody want to undergo osteointegration? integration Why would you want to go through two, maybe two rounds of surgery and an extensive rehabilitation program? What are the potential gains? And what are the patient goals? I mean, that maybe sounds like a cliche, but that's really important to ascertain exactly why they want to undergo this procedure. Uh, is it to improve gait? Improve mobility? It might not improve gait. We've got a very short stump. We might still have a very poor gait, but a high level of function. So we need to match up goals to projected outcomes. Uh, is it to do sports? That may or may not be possible, depending on the uh, type of sports that individual would like to do. We don't want to compromise what is essentially a mechanical device within the body. Uh, is it to increase wear intolerance? Is it to increase comfort? So that really does need to be ascertained uh, right from the outset. So are the goals realistic? Are they achievable? Are they achievable within the patient's uh, uh, physical presentation, for example? Uh, and the last line there, the commitment to the rehabilitation program. Because it is an arduous program, it does require commitment. And Imogen mentioned that earlier on, and she found some of the some aspects of uh, the rehab program quite arduous. Will the projected outcome add a tangible effect, uh, a tangible impact on the quality of life? And I did change that on, on the train over here today. I did have significant, but I thought. I don't, you know, how do we measure significant? What is significant to an individual? It has to be tangible, and it might be very small benefits that really make a, uh, mean a lot uh, to a patient. In terms of investment, will a projected outcome um, justify the investment? The investment's not about money. Money is a part of it, but the investment is the time, the commitment, uh, the rehab program, the two surgeries, the, soci the psychosocial, the social economic impact of, of going through such a program. And patients really do need to understand and accept some of the downside. And I do see presentations sometimes which tend to gloss over the potential complications. And Ricard mentioned earlier that it's not always, when it's going well, it's fantastic. But it is not always without complications and problems. But they can be addressed, but you have to be prepared for that. What could they include? They could include infection. It might be a deep infection, might be a mechanical failure. And patients need to be aware that maybe, potentially, they could lose the implant. It may be replaced again later on. How will that affect an individual? And the programme demands a high level of commitment. And during the OSI integration, we can use tools like the questionnaire for transfemoral amputees, for example, which measures and looks at the degree of function, the degree of activity of a patient using a conventional socket prosthesis. So, for example, if an individual is wearing a limb 13 hours a day, seven days a week, and they're reasonably active, you may question, is OSI integration the best route for that individual? Uh, and, and will there be a, a significant change in their quality of life and outcome against the, the backdrop of potential hazards? And we've spoken about that. The residual limb may end up shorter, so we have a very short stunt, possibly, and OSI integration is often referred to as suitable for patients who have short stunts because they're very difficult to fit, and we've just seen some pictures. And that's absolutely true. The stump may need to be shortened. It may need to be shortened for medical reasons. Chop a little bit off there. It may then later on need to be shortened again if the implant comes out later on. 
what will be the situation then? Will they be able to continue using a socket prosthesis or will they be in a worse position than they set out from? So bear that in mind and it needs to be considered. Ongoing provision needs to be in place to support these individuals throughout the lifetime of the system. Osseointegration, uh, stage two surgery is not the end, it's just the beginning of the journey. And that provision may, may need to kick in five years down the line. As with any mechanical device, it's subject to wear and tear, impact, it will need changes, it might need revisions, uh, and that's going to uh, require some sort of funding and provision in place. So it really is, uh, I think I'll, yeah, the, the, the surgery is the beginning uh, of, the, of the process. When I looked at this slide, when I look at Imogen, I was very pleased to see Imogen here today because, as I said earlier, I met Imogen initially um, 10 or so years ago at Queen Mary's. And this was basically Imogen on this slide. Uh, she didn't have recurrent skin breakdown because she wasn't using a prosthesis, but she had graft tissue, she had a flexion contracture, she had volume fluctuation, she had a very short stump, and the chances of actually getting a good outcome on a high-tech prosthesis is slim. And so that came to be. Um, contraindications would uh, include um, immature skeletal osteoporosis, body weight, that's really important. Um, all of these systems do have a maximum body weight and even if a patient's topping out towards that maximum body weight, anecdotally in my own experience, you do encounter more problems if you're at the top end of the weight, weight limit. Uh, so really encourage patients to optimise their body mass. Um, other contraindications are set out there, including certain drugs, pregnancy. Uh, if I turn to P.I. Bronemark, and we prefer to, Rickard referred to him earlier, he had a definition, one of his definitions for osseointegration, which is fairly straightforward. A fixture is osseointegrated if it's stable and apparently immobile support of the prosthesis, under loads, without pain, etc. And that's, that's fairly straightforward. So if we zoom in a little bit closer, uh, he talks about the close acquisition of new and reformed bone in congruency with the fixture. That makes sense. Uh, so at, light, uh, at microscopic level, there's no interposition connective or fibrous soft tissue. So we don't want the fibrous soft tissue. We don't want a pseudoarthrosis there. We need the bone on the implant. And if we keep that in mind throughout the rehabilitation process, we do not want to do anything throughout that process that will disrupt that relationship between the bone and the titanium. And in the early days, it is quite a vulnerable because we don't have immediate mechanical fixation following stage two osseointegration. It takes some time. Uh, just referring to the OPERA protocol, which Rickard did mention earlier, that was introduced in 1999. The early days that we did at Roehampton, the patients were pre-OPERA protocol. The protocol really sets out the parameters and gives you guidance in terms of the stages of the uh, weight bearing and the loading. Um, of the bone over time throughout that process. So we've accepted the patient, they've onto the program. What can we do early on before surgery? Uh, kind of common sense really, a healthy lifestyle, but really do encourage that. Quit the fags, um, because that will compromise healing, it may well compromise, um, uh, compromise the whole, whole process. And it also, it, uh, it will cause problems later on if, uh, if, if healing is required. And going back to body weight, get your weight down if you're overweight. Uh, then there'll be some work around physiotherapy. Uh, we'll have identified possibly tightness of joints. If a patient's been in a wheelchair for a long period of time, uh, we're going to get tight joints, um, immobility, muscles not being used. So it's that early preparation, also almost pre-rehabilitation, prior to entering the program. Uh, physiotherapy, and so I'm not going to go too much into physio because I'm not a physiotherapist, and I know Maggie will really tell me off if I do that. So. <laughs> we'll get it wrong. Post stage one surgery. So stage one is the insertion of the fixture into the bone. Um, and the receiving bone, as we've mentioned earlier, may require shortening. It might require shortening for two, one of two reasons, possibly. Medically, the, the bone might need to be tidied up. But if it's quite a long stump, it might need shortening so that we have room to introduce the components, the knee joint, for example, and maintain proportionality. Um, we could talk a little bit about long and short stumps, but we'll do that in a few moments. There is the option to use a conventional socket prosthesis um, after stage one. Uh, in my own experience, patients uh, haven't, a couple of patients have gone down that route, but it's never been particularly successful. And by this point, they've had stage one surgery, 
They're there because they've had real big problems with sockets very often and they're quite fixated on the next stage. So they're not really, unless they really have to go back to socket use maybe for their occupation, they're unlikely to do so. Stage two surgery, as Ricard mentioned, six, six months was always the, um, was a time scale, stage one, six months, stage two. Uh, and that is now being reviewed and it is under review. So certainly in certain cases, depending on bone quality, for example, that could actually be three months down the line. But stage two is a pen, the, the fashioning of the penetration site, um, the insertion of the abutment, which is the part you see protruding out at the end of the residual limb or the stump now. Um, and at this stage, there's no mobilization. It's just letting it heal. And I remember Kingsley Robinson being absolutely fastidious about this healing process around the penetration site, um, not to compromise that. And we also used to bear, we do bear in mind, just avoid traction at the end of the stump at that point. For sitting in wheelchairs uh, might cause some traction around that uh, healing, that pen, uh, healing area. So it's really hip joint mobilization. Uh, and it's about three weeks plus that we start to load the bone. So bear in mind, um, we now start the weight-bearing process. So patients aren't at the stage of being able to walk on a full-length prosthesis. The, stump, the, the penetration site has healed, they've done some physio, now we've got to start, to start loading the bone. And be very careful how we do that because we don't want to overload it. So we commence a graded uh, loading program using what we call a short training prosthesis, an example of which is uh, on the screen. Predominantly axial loading, uh, depending on the quality of the bone, or the quality of the bone, they might go at the half speed program or the full speed program. So, for example, if it's um, not a very strong bone, if the cortex is very thin, it may well be half speed. Uh, starting off at loading 10 to 20 kilograms, we do. Th they can do this on scales. They can also do this at home after initial uh, session as an inpatient, which is recommended. 30 minutes, twice a day, loading, increasing incrementally, week on week, until they're able to put the full body weight through that structure, and the full body weight through the intraosseous structure without pain. And at that point, we encourage patients to keep a pain diary. Um, we've got to listen to the body, and if they're experiencing pain, we need to be thinking about, and we usually say over four, they're experiencing pain, we need to maybe take a step back. Maybe it's moving a little bit too quickly. So we have the OPA protocol, we have guidelines, but uh, they are guidelines and we have to respond to each individual. Um, but what we don't want to do is overload too early. And again, a reason for the short training prosthesis to promote axial loading and avoid the big lever arms uh, around a prosthesis. So time scale is dependent on bone quality. Uh, as we're just reinforcing that, release really, a normal speed will start up at 20 kilograms increasing 10 kilos a week, maintenance of pain diary. So in the ideal world, if it all goes really well, a healthy 80 kilogram patient uh, with good bone quality may be full loading in 12 weeks, but it may take a lot longer than that. If we encounter some problems along the way, or if the bone quality uh, is such that we've had to go at half speed. We start gait training at around 10 to 14 weeks. Uh, patients are then commence walking between parallel bars or they're walking with crutches. Maximum load we suggest at that point is around about 20 kilos through the prosthesis. That's very hard to gauge. Well, that's 20 kilos or a bit more, a bit less. But uh, so if there is a force plate available, walk them over the force plate, uh, let them experience what that feels like. In other words, proceed with caution. Uh, so a couple of times a day, we come away from the short prosthesis now and they're mobilizing on the full length limb uh, at uh, between parallel bars or with the aid of crutches. So we're gradually increasing the wearing time uh, in response to each individual under the supervision of a physiotherapist, of course, to put them through their paces. And we monitor, but we moderate activity. Uh, patients, if they're doing too much, they will feel the effect of that the next day. Or if they're encountering difficulties or discomfort, we just pull them back a little bit. It really is during those early days that that bone, uh, that intraosseous Im implant is at most risk of um, disruption. Uh, once it's fully osseous integrated in, there ain't much going to move it, but we don't want to cause any harm in the early days. And then gradually increasing the range of activities. So uh, in, sitting to standing, using stairs. Remember, these are activities that actually 
um, magnify the forces as opposed to just actual loading. So we're starting to introduce uh, large turning moments, what we call turning moments, um, into the system. And the bone will respond to that and it will reform and respond to that over time. Uh, yeah, so continuing 14 to 18 weeks, we're using the prosthesis day in throughout the day. Around about three months, we're, we're, we're coming off crutches. I think the important thing to mention here is not to come off of walking age too early. It's okay to use a stick into the long term. Some patients will always use a stick into the long term. Some patient, patients will want to come off the stick. It's okay. We have to base it on the individual. I would normally, I, I, in my own mind, I tend to think, well, the time to come off a stick is when they forget to use it. And that's kind of the point when they're ready to go. Uh, avoid it, but avoid discarding the walking age too early because that may also may lead to bad habits. Um, so having the walking stick there, if it's a single aid, it's just providing a cantilever. It literally doesn't have, you don't have to put weight through it, but it's just balancing you out and getting you into good habits. In some cases, it will take a long time to really get to, to peak out. Uh, for example, when we spoke about if there's pain during loading, we might need to slow down. And the bone will develop and strengthen in response to loads. Uh, we do find that patients, they get to a certain point, and then one day they do a load more than they usually do. They might go on holiday and work, walk all day. And the next day they're in some discomfort. And sometimes they describe it as a toothache or that sort of deep pain. Um, we kind of call it an osseo hangover. It's as they push the thresholds up and they start to do a bit more, the bone will respond to that. It's okay, but it's just, it's just the process. But great, I, in my experience, great does improve over time, it improves over years, not months. Uh, some patients will never get a really perfect symmetrical gait. Majority won't. It may not be that important to a particular individual. Um, but if they want to improve the gait, you can do things like core stability, physio, practice, not coming off sticks too early, will help towards that end. You will generally, as a rule of thumb, get a better gait in terms of symmetry and walking if you have a longer stump. Because the, the structure of the muscles that actually control and stabilize the pelvis amid stance when you're walking uh, have not been compromised to the same degree as a short stump. Um, yes, and of course, past the rehab process is this ongoing review. Uh, outcome measures, and these are examples of um, outcome measures that we record, uh, gait analysis, but medical review is very important, reviewing the bone, making sure things are okay, uh, and prosthetic, which Andrew's going to talk about shortly. Avoid really high, imp uh, high impact activities, which is kind of, yeah, kind of common sense maybe. Osseointegration integration will facilitate a really high level of activity. When it's going well, it's second to none. <coughs> You can encounter problems somewhere down the road. You have to be prepared for that. It is a mechanical device in the body, and that may start to happen further on down the line. So one of the things to bear in mind, as I've mentioned earlier, is to make sure the provision is there to encounter that. The NHS will not currently support osseointegration unless the individuals have been through um, a, a trial which is, has been supported from the outset by the NHS. That's not to say things won't change. I don't know if they will. Uh, but things are moving on in the NHS in terms of provision, but that's another story. And I just finish off on, because I, I haven't talked about upper, upper extremity. Ricard did show some slides earlier and talked very much about the control. Uh, and the, the development of products for upper extremity patients has outstripped the prosthetics in terms of uh, very high tech hands, control systems, pattern recognition, TMR. But what's missing with socket technology is a stable platform because for these things to work and to work effectively, you need a stable fixation of the prosthesis on the body. It's very hard to achieve that using a socket and straps, for example. And these limbs are quite heavy. So there is fantastic potential for upper limb, uh, upper extremity patient. We have Stuart here today somewhere who went through the program at Rehampton above elbow patient. I'm sure he's happy to talk to people later. Um, and I'm going to leave that there because I've got 15 minutes. I think that's about it. So thank you very much.